What's up everyone? Welcome to part two of today's episode of DSP Inbox, where I answer all of your questions through my uh, Hotmail account, DSP Inbox at Hotmail.com, and also the new thing we're doing today, uh, a couple minutes before I, I decided to record this video, I put something up on my Twitter page, uh, which is They Call Me DSP, um, and I said, hey, throw, throw me some quick questions and I'll try to address them in the video at the end. I got six really quick questions that I'll give really quick answers to. And it'll kind of be like a, a, a turbo round at the end of this video that uh, I think I will add uh, as a part of my videos from now on. Okay, so the next question. Holy crap, this is a long one. Okay, bear with me. This is a long question, but this is a good one. This is from Dean Hevner, by the way, and he says, DSP, I am unaware of your position on answering email. All right, I'm going to skip that whole first paragraph. It's basically just... I saw your video series on Heavy Rain and I was at a loss for words. It was probably one of the best things I had ever watched on TV and theatrical movies included. Well, thank you, Dean. A lot of people say that my Heavy Rain playthrough was my best one because it was a combination of comedy and wit and, you know, everything that was just going on. Improv, basically, which is what I do. Um, and I appreciate that compliment because, I mean, you know, for me to just do that live improv kind of style... And you tell me that's better than these people who put millions of dollars into TV shows and movies. That's a really large compliment, so thank you. Uh, he says, I will probably never watch a video game playthrough that isn't you performing again. Again, thanks. Um, so now I will get to the reason for why I contacted you. Watching your playthrough of Heavy Rain, the Taxidermist, which was the DLC for Heavy Rain, by the way, and the Heavy Rain alternate ending playthrough, that was when I actually replayed Heavy Rain and did some alternate choices to see how they would affect the story. Uh, he says, I want more. Uh, I would like to know if there's any way that I could somehow obtain a physical or a digital copy of your Heavy Rain, the Taxidermist, and Heavy Rain alternate endings on a DVD format, or if I could somehow download those movies. I went to CafePress.com Darkside Phil, you know, that's my Cafe Press page, in the hopes of somehow obtaining a physical or digital copy that I've been seeking, but I didn't see anything. He says, there was a fine selection of merchandise, but I don't see any videos. Um, so if you could please contact me back with regards to whether I can obtain a physical or digital copy. Uh, I Basically, he, he'd think that would be great. Um, a couple things here. First of all, you know, I do retain all of the movies that I put on YouTube, and I do have the hard copies. They're archived on hard drives. Um, so the good news is, if I ever wanted to think to do something like that, I could. But there's a lot of ramifications with something like that. And, you know, basically taking uh, footage of a game and selling it might be the difference between making what I do on YouTube legal or illegal. Um, and the reason I say it is this. Everyone knows Mystery Science Theater 3000. Everyone's heard of that TV series. Well, what they basically do in that series is they watch old, you know, crappy sci-fi movies or horror movies or whatever kind of movies and they talk over them and give it really funny commentary. Um, and that's pretty much what I do, but for those uh, for that series, they actually have to get the rights to all of those movies, meaning they pay a fee to use that movie and to do the commentary and to be able to resell that movie and repackage it with their commentary on it. Um, I don't pay anyone, obviously, to, to do the game footage, and the reason that my game footage ends up being legal is because it's fair use under commentary, under criticism, under parody, there's multiple uses and things that I do with this footage that make it legal. Um, but, unfortunately, as you've seen with all the false copyright claims, it's still, uh, there's still companies like YouTube who really are, you know, they think it's up for debate even though it's not. I, if it would ever go to court, I'm pretty sure that they could make it convincing that it is pretty much legal. But, um, the legality of recording and then selling your footage is a totally different thing. That would be like me you know, watching the movie Ghostbusters, doing commentary over it, and then selling that. Well, obviously, I'm selling you the movie Ghostbusters, which isn't my my property. That's illegal. Um, is reselling someone's playthrough of a game illegal? I don't know. And the reason I say that is, as we've had this debate last year, when you do a playthrough of a game, the difference between a game and a movie is that a game is interactive. And especially a game like Heavy Rain, your choices in the game could completely change your experience of that game and what you're seeing on the screen. So really, a playthrough of a game is legally, I'd say, probably part the game developer's property, but it's also part yours, because your choices created what you see on the screen. Um, and therefore, it would be a really a gray area legally for me to try to sell a DVD of something like that. So unfortunately, I'd have to say, 
for selling it, I don't know. I, I would have to really look into it, try to, you know, get get my, my T's crossed and my I's dotted and basically make sure that it would be, I'd be covered if anyone were to ever try to speak up. Um, however, that doesn't mean that, you know, I might not consider something like that in the future. And also doesn't mean that with some of the song remixes that people have made that I won't maybe seek to maybe sell an album or something like that if people were interested. Um, I now have so many song remixes, I'm pretty sure I could make a pretty lengthy album. Um, and obviously, if something like that were to happen, I would ask the people and the artists who created those songs if they wanted a cut. I would be fair about it. Um, however, I don't know where the hell Ghost Drone's been. I haven't seen the guy for like four months. He hasn't made a remix in quite a while, and a lot of people are asking, where is he? I don't know. So you're asking the wrong person. You'll have to ask him. Maybe he's just taking a break. But there's been a lot of playthroughs where he could have probably made some really good songs, and he hasn't really done anything. And no one else has either. It's not just him. I mean, there used to be a couple other people who do remixes, and no one's really done anything so I don't know what the deal is if people just kind of lost interest in doing it in the project as a project but I don't know anyway moving on um, next question it says dear Phil there are many games being announced such as Bioshock Infinite, Killzone 3 and Little Big Planet 2 most of the games coming up are mostly sequels or extensions to the previous games I have two questions my first question is what do you think of, about, about sequels to games if it's good should they keep making more of the same title over and over, or should they just stop at the first one? My second question is, do you think that any of the sequels or continuation of the game, original games that are coming up uh, interest you like the one stated before? Thank you for taking your time, blah, blah, blah. And that was from Kevin. Um, a sequel is a tricky thing because a lot of the times people say it's always harder to make a sequel as good as the original. Uh, for movies, that's especially true, trying to take a... a a premise of a movie and basically change it enough or rehash it enough or refresh it enough or even lengthen it enough to make a sequel that's as good as the original. Um, and so I guess uh, with video games it's going to be kind of the same. In my opinion really this is the key. It's how much did you change from the original to warrant that this be a separate release and basically do you think it's worth you know an official $60 release. So for example a game like Mass Effect 2, they improved dramatically on the gameplay formula. The narrative of the story was much longer. Um, the only real disappointment, in my opinion, was they focused a lot on the side characters rather than on the main plot. And I think that if you just played the main plot, you probably could have beaten the game fairly quickly, and there's not a lot of meat there. Most of the plot is based around these peripheral characters that you're trying to recruit for your <clears throat> squad, basically. And, uh... Compare that with a game like Bioshock 2, where you really didn't expand much at all upon the first game. I mean, the gameplay was almost identical, besides the fact that you were now a big daddy, and there was one or two, you know, different abilities that you could get. Um, not much really different besides the dual wielding of you being able to use the plasmid and a gun at the same time. I mean, the story was pretty much dead on, similar to the first one. Uh, didn't really elaborate much on the universe. It was kind of like, all right, you're going back to... Uh, Rapture, and it's kind of the same exact area you were in the first game, and just deal with it. Uh, and then on top of that, in that game they tried to add on multiplayer, which unfortunately ended up being kind of hilarious because it wasn't really taken seriously. <clears throat> I personally don't think anyone was asking for Bioshock multiplayer to begin with, so it really depends on what effort you put into your game and, and what the final product ends up being. There's some games that people argue, for example, Sonic the Hedgehog 2, a lot of people say was way better than Sonic the Hedgehog 1 because it improved upon the formula, it added a new character, it added new abilities, it added so much more to the game. So, in my opinion, I mean, should they stop at a, at, if you make a really good game, should you intentionally not make a sequel just to, you know, or keep the integrity of that game what it is? No, I think that everyone who makes something good has the absolute right to try to top it and make a sequel to continue it. But if you're going to do it, don't just send in, you know, don't dial it in. Don't just do it for a check. Do it to actually try to improve your first product and put some effort in. You can really tell when you get a game at works, you watch a movie where they put the effort in in the sequel. For example, Back to the Future 2 versus Back to the Future 1 was really, it was genius. Um... And it really made you feel like, wow, this is a really good uh, sequel. But then you kind of continue on with that series, Back to the Future 3, 
And it was kind of like, all right, let's do the same formula a third time, but now let's do it in the past. It's like, all right, how many times can they rehash this formula? And really, not a lot of people like Back to the Future 3. So it's kind of the similar thing with games. It's like, you have Halo, you have Halo 2, where they make significant improvements to the graphics, to the gameplay. Then you have Halo 3, where, okay, there were some improvements. It wasn't as dramatic as a, of a leap as Halo 1 was to Halo 2. Sure, there was dual wielding, but the dual wielding wasn't massively useful, to be completely honest. Then you had Halo ODST, which really wasn't a jump at all. It was a step backwards, and it was a complete waste of fucking time. And then you have a game like Halo Reach, which, for all intents and purposes, is a good game, but really all it is is a perfected version of Halo 2. And so you ask yourself, gee, were all these sequels warranted? And the answer, ultimately, for a series like Halo is no, they weren't. Uh, Bungie just wanted to keep making versions of the game to make money, and they could have done drastically different things. For example, in Halo Reach, they have a level in the campaign where you're doing space fighting. And you're like, wow, when you're playing this level, you're like, wow, this is some real innovation. You've never done anything like this in the other Halo games. Like, man, I can't wait to jump into multiplayer and do this until you find out that's not in multiplayer. Multiplayer is pretty much vanilla Halo 2 with some game variants and some different modes and things like that. And you're like, why the fuck didn't they put this new game mode, an innovative game mode, into the multiplayer? And the answer is because really, this is what they do. Every year or every two years, they come out with a new version of Halo to cash in. And uh, not to say that Halo Reach isn't a worthy game, because it is, in my opinion, a very good game. Maybe one of the best games of this year, depending on how the next few months go. But... It really seems like once you start playing the multiplayer, you're like, man, this really feels like Halo 2 with a couple variants. And I'm wondering why it seems like they've gone back to that when instead of adding a bunch of new stuff to make it innovative enough to be a different game. The game that really comes to mind to me, uh, for example, is Call of Duty 4 Modern Warfare 1, where they added all kinds of things like kill streaks, like the leveling system, unlocking guns progressively with online play. Now compare that with its sequel, Modern Warfare 2, which came out last year, which really didn't add much at all. It added Death Streaks, which is just a variation on Kill Streaks, which some people thought broke the game. Um, it added not much. It was the same unlocking system, uh, the same kind of leveling. There really wasn't anything added to the multiplayer. And so a lot of people would argue that a game like Modern Warfare 2 is a way to dial it in and just try to make free money, while Modern Warfare 1 was the game where they really put in the the innovation and improved upon the previous games. So it all depends. Sequels can be go either way. In my opinion, sequels are a good thing as long as these developers put in the effort. Same thing with movies. As long as the, the producers and the people who make the movie put in the effort, then a sequel is warranted. Um, all right, we got one more question and then we're gonna go to the quick Twitter questions that I'm gonna fire off here. This one comes from Bozy State Fan. His question is, Hey DSP, I remember when G4 TV had gaming shows. Hey, remember that? When G4 TV actually had gaming shows on it? Holy shit. Such as Cheat, Judgment Day, Electric Playground, Cinematech, and more. And then, when the year hit 2005 or 2006, all of a sudden they canceled all the gaming shows. For me, I was mad. What are your thoughts? Well, my thoughts are this, and this is very simple. The people who made these gaming stations, these gaming TV shows, weren't gamers. They didn't know how to appeal to gamers. And so rather than doing the right thing to market to the right crowd, they sold out. That's basically what happened. So you, know, you have a, a, a channel like G4 TV. <clears throat> when they started, they had some personalities on there. But really when you started watching the show, you're like, wait a minute. These people who are on here really don't seem like gamers. They seem like actors. And that's exactly what they were. They were hiring actors to try to pretend like they were gamers and get your, your buy-in. So, for example, X-Play. Do you really think that Adam Sessler knows a fucking thing about any video game? Absolutely not. He knows absolutely nothing about video games. And wh whoever the girl is they have on there now, she knows even fucking less. And it was hilarious because someone said to me, I forget what it was for. But I guess, the, I guess Morgan Webb, that's her name. I guess someone said, Phil, why are you playing this game? Morgan Webb just reviewed it and gave it like a two. I was like, what? Who the fuck cares what Morgan Webb has to say about a fucking video game? She doesn't play video games. She obviously doesn't know what the fuck she's talking about. Because the game, if I remember correctly, was a decent, at least, game. Nowhere near well, getting the score that she should have given it. 
And I'm like, why would I listen to a talking head who's obviously an a paid actor on TV to tell me what's good about gaming? I'm not an idiot. I'm an adult. I'm a professional. I'm a business person. I have a, a, a serious full-time job. I'm mature enough to be able to weigh the pros and cons of a game and give you guys an honest opinion when I play it. So, no. I mean, it's really annoying to see a channel like that instead of really catering to the gamer, which is what they could have done. What they really could have done is tried to go out there and follow things like MLG and follow things like the Street Fighter Evolution series of tournaments and try to find a way to promote those events and hype them up and make them look like really interesting events because at the core, the core of it, there really is a lot of excitement in the competition that goes on with those events. The problem is the people who produce those channels like G4 have no fucking idea what they're doing. They're obviously not people who were ingrained in the gaming community to know what was interesting. So, you know, they would flail around with shows like Cinematech where they would show you all the, the full motion video clips from games, but how often do you sit there and just watch the full motion video from a video game? I mean, come on. It's, it's the interactive part of a game that really grips us. Uh, what was that other game? There were some other games I remember where they would do playthroughs of the games. Uh, I think I actually watched one of Hitman 2. This guy was doing a playthrough, but there was no commentary. There was no criticism. There were no tips. It was just showed the guy trying to beat the game. It was like a direct feat. Who the fuck wants to sit at their TV and just watch direct feed of a game? That's not funny. That's not interesting. That I, I'll, If I want to do that, I'll go play the fucking game. The thing that makes the difference is finding a personality who can maybe make jokes, explain what they're doing in the game, explain what's easy, explain what's hard, and give their reactions. That's what people want to see. And, you know, people like me are doing it on YouTube. I mean, if you had signed one of us to do that on TV, I, it would have fucking made money. It would have been popular. But... What they ended up doing was they put all these crappy shows on that didn't have a, a serious tone to them, didn't take anyone seriously. In fact, I, I actually do remember, I don't know if it was G4 or another channel, they did cover uh, fighting game tournaments one year, and guess what they did when they went there? They made fun of everyone at the tournament. They were like, gee, are you ever going to get laid? Or gee, do you know where the Krispy Kreme is? Or some bullshit like that, talking to the gamers instead of taking them seriously. And it's like, how could you be a gaming channel when you don't take video games seriously. You think it's a joke that people would even consider a competitive event. I mean, that's ridiculous and it's disrespectful to the people that you're, you're, you're taking video of. So, I don't understand where they were coming from there. Um, and now it's funny because if anyone saw this year at Evolution uh, Fighting Game Championships, Adam Sessler was there and they insisted that he do commentary for the finals which made him look like a complete fucking moron because he knew absolutely nothing about Street Fighter and here he is doing commentary for the finals of the Street Fighter 4 tournament. Duh, G4, once again, their producers having absolutely no fucking idea what people want. We don't want actor Adam Sessler giving live commentary. What you should have had was someone with personality. You had Seth Killian, who was really the technical guy, explaining the technical aspect. You should have had someone with flair, with personality, who also understood what was going on, giving some interesting commentary at the same time. That would have put butts in seats. That would have entertained. But instead, they go back to their staple guy, Adam Sessler, who fucking fails at every turn, and they put him in a seat, and he doesn't know what he's talking about. He even went so far as to say, it's all tied up, when it wasn't even close to being tied up. One guy was way ahead of the other guy uh, in the gameplay. So, what's wrong with those channels? I don't know. They're misguided. They're not f seeking the right people. They're not seeking professional people who know what the common gamer wants to see, who are able to capture interest, and they're failing. And so when you go to G4 TV, that's why most of the time when you watch it today, you see Cops reruns, you see Star Trek The Next Generation, you see, what was that, uh, Ninja Warrior from fucking Japan reruns. You don't see anything to do with gaming because they've actually given up. They've, they've realized that they don't know what the fuck they're doing. They've given up on this as a business venture. And they just decided to put shovel shit onto that channel. Hopefully someone would watch it. The bottom line is... Those reruns get more views than any of their gaming-related content because, again, they don't know how to create proper content. They're not seeking the right people to do that for them. It's a shame because there's people out there like me, like plenty of other people, who'd be willing to save their companies, but they don't actually go out and seek the right talent. Instead, they keep hiring Adam Sessler to try to do it for them. So maybe one day they'll wise up, uh, but right now it's not looking too good. That's all I can say about G4 TV. All right, six questions. Really quick answer. These are my Twitter questions. Here we go. Number one, what do you think of the PS Move now that you've played it? My answer is, I actually am impressed with the PS Move. I think the controls are way better than the Wii, especially the three-dimensional controls. 
uh, of being able to move forward and backward with the depth perception. And uh, overall, I think that there's a lot of potential. However, I don't know if any third-party developers are going to really use that potential or if it's just going to die out. I guess we have to, to wait and see. Um, next question. What is your sexual preference? What a stupid fucking question. Have you watched any of my playthroughs? Obviously, I like women, you dumb fuck. I mean, I talk about tits and ass and pussy and vagina and shit and blowjobs, like, all the time. So I don't know why you would think that I'm not, you know, a straight dude. That's a really dumb question. Um, will you ever play a game drunk again like you did with Spider-Man, Web of Shadows, and Fallout 3? I don't know, and the reason I say that is I think my playthroughs really are coming out a lot better now that I'm sober. Like, for example, Heavy Rain would have not been anywhere near as good as it was if I was drunk because I wouldn't have been, you know, shooting from the hip, making wise cracks, making those funny jokes and things and observations that I was able to make. So, however, for games like Fallout 3, for a game like Web of Shadows, where really I didn't want to make too many jokes, it was more like grinding through the games, maybe that is a little bit more funny, I don't know, but for the most part I don't do that anymore just because I try to take it a little bit more seriously. I think I have enough of a following now that I should take it seriously rather than just fuck around and, like I said, dial it in. I don't dial it in. I try to put maximum effort into what I do. So, unfortunately, I probably won't be drinking anymore when I'm playing those kind of games. Um, are you going to Evolution next year? Evolution is the Nationals in the U.S. of fighting games. The answer is a maybe, but a strong maybe. It really depends on Marvel vs. Capcom 3 and what I think about it when it is released and if I feel like it's a competitive enough game to play seriously. Um, Marvel vs. Capcom 1 and Marvel vs. Capcom 2, I was a serious competitor in those games, tournament competitor. I traveled all around the country to play them. I was known in them. And uh, I'm if this game is good enough, I might get back into it, but I guess we'll have to see. Um, but hell, I mean, even if I don't get into it, it might be worth it just to show up to EVO for one last time, give it one last hurrah, get a thousand of my fans in there, pack the fucking place, and just blow it up. I mean, I think that would be a pretty cool thing to do in Vegas. Uh, you know, I, I don't know what you guys think, but just to do one last hurrah and just fucking live it up with, you know, meeting all kinds of people out there and just having fun and living it up might be a good idea. So, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. Next, the last question is, how do you plan on playing the Microsoft Connect with, with your back problems? Great question, because as everyone knows, unlike the PS Move, which is just two hand controllers, the Connect actually is a camera that records your whole body motion, and the answer is this. I'm going to play it very carefully, and I'm going to try to be careful and not hurt myself, and hopefully I won't, and hopefully it will be successful. If not, if I start playing a game and it sucks or I hurt myself, well, then I'm going to have to stop. But I'm going to give it a go. We're going we're gonna to try it together and see how it works out. Final question for this DSP inbox. What do you think of Street Fighter tier lists? I think that they exist to basically explain the level of skill that's needed to, number one, learn a character, and number two, play at a high level with a certain character. But by no means do I actually believe that tier lists will dictate the final ability of someone to win with that character. And a perfect example is Super Turbo. Absolutely, there are characters in Super Turbo that are easier to play with than others, that may be better overall than others, and have better matchups. But the bottom line is, go to Japan, you'll get your ass beat by the crappiest character and the best character, because those guys have learned the game so much, they've learned every matchup, it becomes all about reaction, about the overall game plan, and about capitalizing on people's mistakes, much more than it's just about a matchup or a character selection. So, tier lists exist. Basically to teach you who can you learn quickly, who can you win with quickly, but on a higher level, tier lists really don't matter. Because once you learn a game to that level, anyone can win with any character. So, Alright, that's it for this episode of DSP Inbox. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope I answered uh, a lot of your questions. Again, for the next episode, I'll probably do it in two to three weeks. Send your questions to dspinbox at hotmail.com or keep your eyes on my Twitter page. They call me DSP. And... Uh, I will probably half an hour to a couple minutes before I make my next video be announcing, hey, let's take some quick Twitter questions, and I'll throw them up, and uh, I'll answer them in the video. So thanks a lot. Thanks for tuning in. See you guys next time.